my name is Eric Studebaker. Uh, email studebaker.farms.beef at gmail.com. Uh, I've put out a newsletter uh, once a month that is directly sick for farmers. It is a farmer only thing, uh, is what it's intended for. It's little tips and tricks that we find out on our farm that I like to share with everybody else. So if you're interested, if you email 3 by 3 rd to that email, you will get added to that newsletter list. Uh, if you like Instagram, you can follow us at the husband, husband's mistresses. My wife started that because um, she thought that Farm was my mistress. So that's how I got started. Uh, who am I? So I'm a farmer and rancher. Uh, I need to update this. I had to go talk to my old man uh, and kind of get some history because cover cropping and no-till got started long before I was born. Uh, but my dad started in 2006. He started um, cover cropping, got started with the uh, NRCS. I think at that time uh, they were paying $20 an acre for us to cover crop. It would, uh, basically cost us $15 to put it in the ground and then another $7 per seed. So it cost us $2 an acre to cover crop. Uh, and that's how we got started doing it. Uh, we are strictly corn, soybean rotation, non irrigated. Uh, we have a cow cap operation. Uh, my particular expertise is extensively in rye cover crop uh, trial knowledge. I, there's lots and lots of options out there. Um, when I started this 12, 13 years ago, I wanted to dive into every possible nook and cranny. Um, so I wanted to eliminate as many variables as possible when I started with this. Uh, cereal rye is one of the most bulletproof cover crops you can use out there. Um, so that's why I am specifically with cereal rye. I have lots of knowledge there, very little knowledge with other cover crop types. Um, this is our first year of wheat experimentation and cover crop. Uh, we are doing that specifically for the corn side. Um, for those of you that have su had success with cereal rye and corn, good on you, not me. Um, I would like to figure it out. I have not figured out how to get those two to match up really well in my system that we use. Um, so that's why this is the first year of using what we think. Um, air cover one. So if you look right there, that is a machine that we put together. Well, I put together this year. My dad didn't want to put up the money for it. It was really, really expensive. Uh, but basically we, we put together a machine that allows us to air seed uh, whatever we want. So fertilizers, uh, products, cover crops, whatever you, you want to put in there. Um, that's a dry product we can put through that machine and we can uh, basically seed it into the ground. So seeding fertilizer is kind of a weird thing, but we can do that. Um, with that, you also have separation issues. That's why we put this machine together. It allows you multiple bins, blend it into, send it down the road, uh, put it in the ground. Uh, so what are we doing now? So planting rye and wheat for cover crop, uh, spreading versing planting rates, uh, lots of ex lots of experience in that. We'll talk about that later. Uh, blending cover crop and fertilizer into uh, that's the air cover one I talked about, um, and we just started to incorporate it into our cattle operation a little while ago. Unlike most of the presenters up here, when we got started, it was exclusively for the corn soybeans. We didn't use it for the cattle. Didn't really like it for the cattle. We extensively had it for crops. So for those of you that don't have cattle, I'm up here to say that you can do it just on the crop side and there are lots of benefits and it takes. Um, R&D on the farm. So this is a big one I'm gonna talk about. Uh, this is really important for farmers for whatever reason. Farmers are terrible at creating vision and goals. Uh, so we'll start with planting cover crop. So we plant cover crop October, November, uh, playing with air seeder or this last year we used air cover one. Um, we usually use more than 60 pounds uh, for weed control. Uh, on the beans only side, we are planting into it green for weed, weed suppression and erosion control. Um, good story about that. So I got invited to go speak at, I don't remember what it was called, but it was down, down in St. Louis, Missouri. Uh, There's a bunch of professors, scientists, all the people I don't like to hang out with. <laughs> they brought me in because they wanted a farmer on the panel. And throughout that three-day conference that I was sitting there, I come to realize that uh, this was two years ago, I think I was there. We do not have a good weed suppression option out there chemically. It 
it was very depressing uh, from the scientific point of view at how frustrated uh, the scientists were and how doom and gloom it really looked. It, uh, it does not look bright for our future in the side of chemicals. Uh, all right, so uh, beans. So termination of Covercraft at T2, uh, we use Roundup. Some people don't like that. Uh, we have a big management issue in our system. Uh, I say issue, it's kind of like a challenge, I guess you could say. I call it an issue because I'm the one that has to deal with it most of the time. Uh, sec second pass, uh, we'll do a residual um, and a termination pass if needed. Um, biggest advantage for us is massive erosion and weed control. Those are the two big advantages that we see uh, <laughs> on our operation. Uh, weed control, we have mass weed control. Cereal rye is one of those uh, few plants. You can go out there, plant it, harvest it, and never have to put any chemical down. It does a great job at suppression, but you don't even really need the biomass. It's got that uh, toxin that it produces in the soil that competes with corn. Uh, beans do not compete very well with the cereal rye, so cereal rye and beans do really well together. Um, it, it just does a great job of weed control. Erosion, a uh, great story I have. This was, I don't know, 2019, 2018. Uh, no, 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 this was a long time ago. This was like 08, 010. I was uh, planning, we had this weird storm. We were supposed to get rain in o Omaha and Ashland, not where I'm from, Lincoln. And uh, I'm out there planting away, you know, happy-go-lucky type kid, just happy to be sitting on a tractor, not school. And I got caught in just a monsoon uh, storm, like two inches, 30 minutes type situation. I called my dad and said, hey, come pick me up. I'm not driving this tractor back to the farm because I can't even see out my windshield. Get in the truck and before we get two or three miles down the road, rain stops and we're kind of looking left to right. And uh, we had one field that had been planted to cover crop and the field across the road did not. Pretty identical farms. Uh, the one, you couldn't even see the water. You couldn't see it moving in the field. Couldn't even tell it was raining five minutes ago. The other one, uh, streams just absolutely gutted that field. It looked absolutely terrible. Um, that guy had a terrible problem coming to him the next couple of days. So that was a big selling point for us. Uh, we don't live in flat square ground. We have a lot of contour, stuff like that. Um, cover crops has helped us eliminate a lot of contour issues we've had. Uh, but as far as corrosion control, there's really nothing better. Uh, the corn side, uh, we terminate five to seven days before planting uh, with the rye. That has to do with the toxin that's produced with the rye so we don't get interference with germination. Uh, nitrogen management is extremely important in corn uh, with the rye. Rye is a great scavenger and stealer of nitrogen, and that is one of the reasons why they compete so um, tough together, corn and rye. So we, I haven't figured out the corn side very well, but uh, Here's some of the problems. Oh, uh, splitting nitrogen. So this is something I want to talk about. Uh, Mitchell talks about little nuggets you can pick up here. One of our biggest cost savings that we've had on our farm is splitting our nitrogen application. So base rate variable application later. So I don't know if you guys remember, there was this massive hail storm that went down I-80. Well, guess what? It damned us too. It just obliterated our corn. Um, just absolutely terrible. Well, at that time, we had started split applying our nitrogen 3228 up front, and then we come back with some urea, and that was always dependent on what our sample, our uh, grid sample had recommended for the year, our goals. Uh, so that was, but that number would move according to what our forecast looked like and what our current situation was. Well, we got hailed out, and we picked a field that was kind of on the edge, basically the field that had the best chance of doing anything good. We went out there and put that second application of nitrogen out. Combines rolled through. We realized that was the total weight, biggest waste of money ever. Um, so that one field, it was a big experiment for us. Uh, but basically, it saved us about $70 an acre that year. And all the guys that came out there put in hydrus, put all 200 pounds up front. They were uh, really kicking themselves that year because all that nitrogen is probably in the water. Uh, so T2. So... That gives you a good example of what, uh, when we're terminating it, so right there about the stage, right before it heads out. I have found, personally, um, don't really have 
much data besides what we get off our uh, harvest maps. Um, if we harvest it before T3, generally, we do not see the yield loss in our soybeans at all. If we wait and it gets a little bit too late, we will see a three to four bushel yield lag on our soybeans. So uh, the way we do it is we terminate really late. It's always dependent upon the cereal rye and what stage it is in. Um, sometimes that's as early as June 5th. Sometimes that's as late as July 20th. So you can get away with a lot, but the whole system is dependent upon how fast that rye grows. This is just air cover one. Um, picture's kind of hard to see. It's this from this year. Um, Rye came up even though conditions are absolutely terrible. Um, you can blend fertilizers, rye, any product you want. Um, that's something that I'm excited to share uh, upcoming years. I was a little worried about if it was going to work this year because completely new thing we put together and everything that I've hooked for it has been a success. Success. I don't so I'll have more to share about that later coming on. Uh, spreading versus planting. A couple of really big insights with this. So I've some, done some stuff with the NRCS um, and their Haggy. I don't know if you guys know, uh, there's a uh, on-farm research, I think is in charge of it now, but they have a Haggy, runs through your field while the corn is still up, drops cover crop, cover crop in between the rows. Um, done trials with that. I've done trials with uh, taking a dry fertilizer machine run it through corn and beans while the crop is still green and spreading it that way. Um, I've done some plane, drone, helicopter, uh, about any way you can apply cover crop, I've, I've tried it. Uh, really jealous in the fact that we are a uh, not irrigated operation. For the, those of you that are irrigated, you guys have a lot more options than I do, that's for sure with cover crops. Um, when you're spreading cover crop, if you're not planting it, it requires rain for it to come up. So if you spread it and it doesn't rain for two weeks, probably not going to come up. That's why the irrigation guys have a big advantage over me. They can go in, they can spread it, whether it be a dry spreader, whatever it is, and they can send that pivot around and it'll come up. Um, I either have to time it before a rainfall event and get lucky, or I have to drill it. So most of my success has been with drilling. Um, when you drill it, it does not require hardly any moisture at all for it to come up, especially cereal rye. Cereal <laughs> rye is one of those plants you can just spill it on the ground and it'll come up better than the corn you planted that year. Uh, so a couple things. So uh, I've done trials, uh, 50, 70, 100, 140 pounds. Um, I've gone all the way up to 400 pounds uh, one year. That was an interesting thing. Uh, about 200 pounds of it never even came up because it outcompeted itself. Uh, but basically, what I'm here to tell you is that right right between a bushel to a bushel and a half, if you're trying to get weed suppression, cover crop, and your biological is going, pound of, or a bushel to a bushel and a half of rot cereal rye is what you kind of need to be successful. Uh, so why do Studebaker farms do cover crops? So number one, soil erosion control. Uh, terrace tear out. So this is a little uh, uh, controversial for the government guys in the room. Uh, we have, uh, we, I do not like contour farm. I really hate it. I like flat square. We don't have much of it, but wherever I can make it flat square, that's what I try and do. So we have uh, basically been able to get away with removing terraces. So uh, we haven't done the whole full plowing, uh, you know, major steep back terrace tear out, but we can basically uh, farm farms that need terraces without terraces. Uh, so with the cover crops, we're able to get away with that. We've been audited before. Uh, we've had farms that have, you know, got pulled out of the hat, got audited. So they come out, they check, see where, uh, what you have for issues. And if you need to put in terraces, waterways, stuff like that, our farms have passed with fly colors with that. So if you're worried about that from that standpoint, cover crops are a great way to not have to spend extra money for terraces or to allow you to farm flat and square. Oh, nope. less coming to uh, yeah. So uh, more RTK and variable rates. So uh, the last couple of years we really got into RTK farming. So farming inches rather than farming acres. That's so a big thing for us. So we do a lot of variable rate farming in RTK. Uh, it's really hard to do that on a contour farm in scale. So 
being able to turn our fields that are not flat and square into flat square fields uh, makes a big advantage for us in our profitability. Oh, so uh, one of my slides got messed up, but that's right. Uh, on this picture, I want to show you guys. So this is what, so that's our corner planer right here. Notice how the rye is very dead before we're going out for corn. Okay. This is what beans looks like. So we actually, this is late. So our bean planter got out there late. I think this was in 2021 or 2020. Uh, we had an early or really wet spring. So this would be May when we got to planting it. Almost all of our beans are put in in the first half of April or, you know, mid-April. So we get our beans in very, very early. Um, we don't terminate until we hit that uh, T2 stage. So we try to let them go as long as possible. And the reason why we like that T2 stage is there is a, uh, that's right when it starts to go from the vegetative to more of a straw type stem. Uh, if you terminate it when it's too early, you get to July and that straw is not there. So that uh, that rye has decomposed. Um, if you wait a little bit longer, that it'll lay over and it'll be like uh, you took you took a straw and just basically mulched your entire field. So by waiting as long as you possibly can, that rye will create this nice blanket and allow just all that moisture to stay there. Uh, and keep that soil right where it needs to be. Good. Okay. Right, so uh, I talked about when we started this, almost all of it was not for uh, not for the cattle co cattle operation over the last couple of years. We started to try and do that as much as possible. So Mitchell talked about relay cropping. I call it double double cropping. Uh, so planting beans and chopping uh, silage at the same time. So something this we uh, found out started is we'll come in in the back half of April, 1st of May, and we'll plant our soybeans into our rye. We'll never terminate it. Chopper guy will come by, we'll swath that field. That's got them soybeans that are growing. They're about two, three inches tall. We'll swath it, rake it, chop it, take it off the trucks that are weighing 30,000 pounds, and then we'll let that uh, soybean field take it off and go. And we will get about four or five bushel lag compared to regular. But if we were to have waited and not planted that in April or May, and we would have waited until the back half of May to plant it, we would have seen a 15 to 20 bushel lag. So we're picking up an extra 10 bushel on our soybeans by basically, basically planting it before we go in and chop it. So that's one big thing that we do. We feed uh, a lot of rye, uh, chopped rye, our cow, cow, cow calf operation, um, just for the fact that we don't need a lot of high quality forage, we just need a lot uh, high volume of forage. Um, reduce use for alfalfa. So uh, we're hoping this will be the first year to not have any alfalfa fields. So our last alfalfa field just basically hit its termination date. We're going to try and operate our entire cow calf operation uh, without buying any hay. Uh, so uh, grass and rye are going to be our two sources of feed. Um, no corn, no grains, uh, basically trying to get it all done that way. We don't graze any of our cover crops unless it's an incidental, incidental grazing. So we'll graze our, uh, our corn stalks, uh, but our operation is basically strictly for the use of the uh, crop itself. Emergency backup plan. So uh, those of you that remember how dry it was this last year, um, we got to the spring and, and so from October, November, all the way until July 4th, we had seen one and a quarter inches of rain. It's funny. So that is a long time to go without any rain. Uh, we've gone through, done our, uh, normal plant on the corn side. We had terminated planting our corn bean side. We hadn't terminated yet. We were right at that decision point where we were thinking, man, should we terminate it? Should we not? Uh, there's some crop insurance issues that go in there with that. So um, some big, big management decisions were getting made there. Um, what that really exposed for me from a management standpoint was if we did not get any more rain for the rest of the year, we still had a backup plan. 
other guys that had cattle were looking for places to get forage. We have all of our cash crop acres still have forage on them. So we had a backup plan. If I wasn't gonna be able to raise a bushel of corn or a bushel of beans, I still had a forage out there for them to go uh, get a hold of. Um, with that, we also kind of looked out and hurt ourselves at the same time. Uh, with that, the planting, it was so dry that our beans basically uh, got droughted out by our rye. Um, that was a blessing and curse in and of itself, and I'll tell you why here. Uh, we dried out our beans, and it was a big learning principle for us. It was so dry that our beans weren't able to get up and get, get going, essentially. While almost all of our neighbors replanted their beans, um, you know, got basically all, all, everybody's beans got terminated. Ours got terminated, but that rye was still there, and then when we came and killed it, we started then as in July to August, I want to say we got 12 or 13 inches of rain. So we got a lot of rain in a short period of time. We went and planted our beans and they took off and did really, really well. And then the rain shut off again. We did a lot better in <coughs> moisture retention than our neighbors did just because of the fact that our soil had better filtration, um, didn't have the soil erosion issues, just all the things that everyone else has been up here talking about uh, we were able to capitalize on in that so-so. All right, so creating success. So uh, for those of you that don't know, I used to be a Division I athlete for the University of Nebraska. Um, I wrestled for the Nebraska for five years, had a lot of fun. But with that, it created a, uh, a vision for, not a vision, it, it, uh, it taught me about goals and creating vision and things that you need to do to be successful. Farmers are really bad at having vision with where they're going. They're also really bad at creating goals. As a population in general, humans are really bad at creating goals. So I want to spend a little bit of time and talk to you today about why those things are so important. So goals, they create vision and direction. So you might have been farming, but you had no idea why you're doing what you're doing. Why are you out there doing um, what, why are you out there uh, putting so much nitrogen down? Why are you out there, uh, you know, running one piece of equipment versus other? Why are you doing what you're doing? Why are you uh, raising one crop versus the other? So asking why is really, really important. I think we have all heard someone say, we have always done it that way. I have watched more farms die from that phrase than anything else. Um, that is a very, very toxic phrase uh, to hear. And that's not to say that uh, change is good, but staying the same is really bad. In the, uh, in the uh, competitive world, if you're not proving, you're falling behind. So as a Division I athlete, if I wasn't getting better, everyone else was accelerating fast. Right. Short and long-term goals. So on our farm, we have a three-by-three three program. So we pick three goals and three categories that we want to prove every year. So we create nine goals every year. We get everybody together. Uh, we pick which aspects of people that we need to be included. We create goals. It creates a vision for the team, creates a vision for the farm, and gets everybody on board. Uh, you want to include as many people as possible. So this creates a uh, sense of community. Uh, gets everybody on board with the vision direction. So smart, so creating smart goals. So specific, measurable, attainable, relevant time. So time is probably one of the most important there. We A lot of people create goals, but then don't create a end date on it. So making sure that you're working towards that by adding time to your goal. Uh, visible, so all of our goals on our farm, uh, when you walk into our shop, you have to walk through the office. Well, there's a door between the office and the shop. All of our goals are posted on that door. So everybody, all our employees, people, uh, my dad, mom, everybody that walks through, they see those goals every day. Accountability. Uh, this is a great tip for young farmers. So uh, as mentioned before me, uh, sometimes your dad can be your biggest enemy and your biggest fan at the same time. Uh, so if you need to create change using R&D, so research and development, creating goals is a great way 
to get change and accountability on the part towards progressing towards a common goal. Um, so that's a great tip for young farmers or people that are looking to make change. So how are you improving? So the 3 and 3 program that I talked about, that's something that we do. So three things that we wish to learn agronomically. So ways that we can use wheat in our cover crop, how much is too much P and K to infer, uh, smart corn, test plots. Those are all different types of goals that we have on our farm um, that have allowed us to learn and grow and start to succeed. Uh, this is just the same thing for the beef side. Uh, so this is a really important slide here. So my top five recommendations for success. So I've been cover cropping for a really, really long time. Um, and everyone asks me, you know, kind of, what, what can I do as a farmer to uh, have success because I don't know anything. So start small, but with a goal. So st starting small is a great way uh, to make sure that you fail, but fail successfully. Failing is really important if you want to grow. Um, that was one of the biggest things that, as an athlete is we basically train ourselves to make sure to fail as much as possible. So make sure you fail small and with a goal. Uh, start with rye. Rye is one of those species of cover crop that is insanely hard to screw up. Um, it's, it's really hard to screw up. Also, make sure you start with soybeans. Don't start with rye, corn. Start with rye and soybeans. Those two work really well together. I've seen numerous farmers, they get all excited about cover crops. They go talk to their co-op. They say, hey, I'm going to plant cover crops. I'm going to plant rye. I'm going to put it by corn. They go ask the co-op to spray it. Co-op gets there late. They go ahead and plant anyways. They terminate it. And then they're lagging 50, 70, 80 bushel in their yield. And they're mad. They're pissed off. I would be too. So don't do rye and corn. So start with rye and soybeans. Uh, tip number three, pick your worst field. So pick the one that's the steepest, the rockiest, the least, the, the one farm you don't like to farm. That's the one I suggest starting with cover crops. Uh, Tip number four, uh, choose to make mistakes and make them on a small scale. So basically teach yourself how to act. That's really important in our industry. I don't think there's enough of that. And then my last and my favorite tip for everybody is KISS. Anybody know what KISS is? Thanks. In both sides. Painful, keep it simple, stupid. Thank you.